Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Praveen Kundurti, and uh, I'm one of the uh, AI solutions engineer at Intel. And um, uh, in today's session, uh, we'll be covering the first part of the learning series for data parallel essentials for Python. And um, uh, uh, along with me is Bob Cheeseborough, and um, he's my colleague. Uh, and uh, he works on the similar projects and, uh, you know, he's there monitoring the chat window and, you know, any questions you got, you got like, you know, he'll be uh, answering those and we'll also uh, catch up with the Q&A in the uh, end of the session. Uh, Bob, you can interrupt me if you, you know, if you uh, want to, if there are any questions, right. So with that, uh, let's uh, start uh, into this uh, uh, presentation today. So this presentation, um, it also involves hands-on exercises. Will be, you know, I'll try to, uh, uh, you know, do some hands-on exercises on JLSE. So I also posted a link on uh, chat window for registering to Intel Dev Cloud, and um, figure out it's a couple of minutes time. It takes it, it doesn't take more than two times for you to set up the account in Dev Cloud. So please register to that, you know, and you know. Uh, we can download the content from GitHub and, you know, uh, uh, we can do the hands-on exercises along uh, with this uh, uh, while I'm presenting, right? Um, and also, if permits, right, uh, we'll also if uh, set up a JLSE, uh, uh, Jupiter, set up Jupyter Lab environment in the JLSE if you have JLSE account um, already. Um, if you don't have, please register to the Intel doctor. If you don't have JLSE, if you got JLSE, you know, we can try setting up, uh, installing, you know, set up the one API environment into our JLSE environment and um, set up a Jupyter lab environment and then launch the Jupyter lab and run some examples of JLSE too. That, uh, let me start with the agenda, right? Um, so we'll see what is one API, right? What are the challenges that we are seeing? Um, and, uh, uh, we'll see what uh, one API uh, AI analytics toolkit comes up with. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, number data parallel essentials, which is you know, the extension called a number DPEX, uh, which is uh, the uh, one of the extensions that comes with the, the data parallel essentials for Python. We'll also talk about a, uh, another important uh, module in this is uh, data parallel control for or devices manipulate, you know, or the USM device memories and uh, getting hands onto a device using Python and stuff. And um, we'll also uh, introduce you to the uh, NG decorators, uh, different types of NG decorators, uh, and how you can actually offload your code in parallel to a device using this NG decorator and um, uh, kernel decorator. Uh, which is a uh, OpenCL type of uh, programming model for GPUs. And they say, you know, this, uh, we'll use a kernel decorator in Python and see how we can uh, see some simple examples on that. And as I mentioned, we'll do, try to do some hands-on exercises uh, for automatic offload using NGIT. We'll see some explicit parallel offload using NGIT. We'll see some code samples on the DPCTL, how to get uh, hands on to a device, how we can actually manage, uh, how we can actually manage the memory uh, using the ND arrays or there is another upcoming new approach called the compute follows data approach. We'll also briefly look into that approach. With that, let's see what the programming challenges. Uh, current, in the current world, it was recognized right today. Each kind of data centric hardware uh, like, you know, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and any other AI accelerators, right? That needs to be, uh, you know, typically needs to be programmed differently. And these are all different languages, they are different libraries, they're all unique, right? And it requires like maintaining a whole bunch of different code bases and libraries. And, uh, and you know, with this inconsistent tool support, um, it actually caused developers uh, to have to learn a whole bunch of different paradigms and programming languages, you know, um, they may be stronger in some and they may be not in others, right? So it's just a challenge. So uh, for developing that software, each you know platform requires a um, separate investment with little ability to reuse the work uh, to target different kinds of architectures. 
So that is a challenge, right? So what's the solution? The solution is, you know, an API. And the goal of an API is to deliver a unified uh, software development environment across CPUs and uh, GPUs and different types of accelerator architectures. So one API is a industry initiative. And what you are seeing today are um, Intel's implementation of one API, but it's very much an open industry initiative. And, you know, um, it's, you know, and uh, you can do your pull request and, you know, change suggestions, et cetera. So the goal is to deliver a unified language and a set of libraries that provide full uh, native code performance across different types of hardware, like, you know, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and any other accelerators that can come into the existence in future. So uh, one API is a foundational programming stage and it's used to optimize uh, middleware frameworks, uh, uh, like, you know, if you see some multiple AI frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, and uh, uh, the Intel distribution of Python that comes with uh, uh, SciPy, NumPy, optimized versions of SciPy, NumPy. Uh, also from the machine learning world, we got the Intel enabled scikit-learn. And so there are lots, lots of kinds of uh, uh, frameworks um, uh, that are uh, you know, optimized uh, as part of the uh, Intel AI, AI analytics toolkit. So let's actually look into what's inside the AI analytics toolkit, right? Um, so if you see this growth of the AI, the machine learning and data centric applications. Um, so the industry needs a programming model that allows our developers, right? Uh, to take advantage of um, uh, rapid innovation in uh, processor architectures, right? So TensorFlow, if you see uh, TensorFlow, it supports one API industry initiative. And um, it's also based on open specification API, right? So it, TensorFlow uses one API today, um, Xeon processors, and we actually, you know, look forward to using uh, these to run on the for future Intel architectures. Similarly, for Intel optimization for PyTorch, you know, uh, the, you know, same thing it applies to runs on Xeon processors and looking forward for uh, GPUs and stuff, right? And we got optimized versions of Intel extension for scikit-learn uh, with a wide variety of machine learning algorithms like you got k-means, uh, db-scan, k-nearest drivers, um, support vector machines, and uh, you know, currently uh, almost like 30 to 35 uh, extensions uh, of these uh, Intel extensions of scikit-learn, right? Um, which are uh, you know optimized on top of the stock scikit-learn algorithms, and uh, all these extensions we got uh, currently we got a mechanism to offload to GPUs. In addition, I'll be talking about uh, number uh, DPEX today, right? Number DPPI today, um, which comes with the Intel distribution of Python and the AI analytics toolkit. Um, and we'll be talking through number today. In addition to that, if you see, we got NumPy, SciPy, which are, uh, you know, based on 1MKL under the hood for mathematic computations and stuff. So let's also see what the AI stack for uh, Intel. Uh, XPUs. So if you see for the first one is we got, uh, uh, if you want to accelerate end to end uh, AI and data specific pipelines, and uh, you got, uh, we got drop in replace uh, acceleration with optimized Python tools built for one API libraries, something like uh, one MKL, uh, one DNN, one CCL, one DAL, uh, and more. And, you know, we can, uh, we can achieve high performance deep learning training and inference with uh, Intel optimized TensorFlow and PyTorch, and also we got low low support for low precision optimization with support for floating point sixteen, um, Int eight, float uh, point thirty two, etc. And also in, including that we got this increasing machine learning model accuracy and performance as mentioned with as I mentioned right with uh, uh, Intel optimization enabled scikit-learn, uh, and also XZBoost is optimized for Intel architectures. So let's actually that let's look at what is inside the data parallel version shields for Python. So a number data parallel number DPPy is a standalone extension to the number JIT compiler that adds uh, SQL programming capabilities. SQL is uh, if you are not if you are aware of SQL is a Chrono SQL is a 
um, programming, uh, you know, it got the inbuilt heterogeneous and parallel programming support, I'd right? say so C++, uh, you know, based, what that's what actually one AP based on, but data, data parallel Python is a wrapper around the SQL and um, uh, it adds the uh, SQL programming capabilities to Python using number, right? And um, it's actually packaged as part of the Intel uh, distribution of Python, which as mentioned, right, it comes both with uh, AI analytics, <clears throat> Intel one API AI analytics toolkit, and also with one API based toolkit. And uh, you really don't need to install any specific Conda package. You just install uh, the AI analytics toolkit and um, uh, you should directly get in this um, Intel distribution of Python and uh, you can directly compile your uh, number of DTP applications. So it also ensures, right, we have an ecosystem based on SQL and one API in general. And uh, we use that to ensure uh, various, uh, this is specific for various Python uh, libraries, right? Uh, uh, and um, uh, also come upcoming new, new libraries are actually can follow this standard. So the end goal is, right, we let Python users uh, benefit from these XPU technologies, you know, without changing anything in the ecosystem. Um, also, we're using this Numba compiler, we write SQL programming using kernels, uh, which I said kernel decorator, right, which is actually, you know, um, a GPU style of programming, if you're ever in the GPU world, we'll use this kernel decorators and uh, we'll see how we can offload to devices. And uh, we are offloading two devices to take advantage of this data parallelism, right? So that is uh, the data parallel essentials for Python. And the other module, important module we talk about is the data parallel control. Data parallel control is a uh, lightweight Python wrapper over a a uh, subset of Kronos SQL's API. So I told you, right, uh, SQL is, uh, Kronos SQL is a uh, heterogeneous programming API and it's based on C++ and DPCTL actually provides a lightweight Python wrapper. So you can see how you can select a device, how you can create a queue, how you can off use a particular queue with the device and offload to your device. So you can, this is the DPCTL layer that you used to do all that stuff. And there are actually four main modules in DPCTL. Uh, the, the, uh, the first one, the, you know, uh, the first one is DPCTL. If you see the DPCTL layer there, it comes with DPCTL memory. It wraps uh, something like USM allocators um, uh, and DPCTL actually program wraps um, uh, the Python array API specifications. And uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the tensor actually, DPCTL the tensor is uh, the one that handles the um, array library complying to Python array API specifications. And um, um, the DPCTL also comes with the, the USM, you know, USM is the unified shared memory programming in the SQL specifications. So it's a pointer-based, <clears throat> it's a pointer-based C++ a mechanism that you can actually use to, um, you know, uh, send the memory to a device. And uh, we'll see how we can have, we are handling it in the Python layer using this DPCTL, right? So the main purpose, the features as uh, to wrap up this DPCTL, right? Are it creates the Python wrappers for SQL runtime classes to uh, offload to, like, you know, to actually interact with the uh, uh, SQL 2020 spec um, features like platform devices, uh, device selectors and stuff. And we also got a USM memory manager uh, to create Python objects that use this SQL USM uh, data allocation. Uh, we'll see that using a buffer protocol, we'll run into simple examples how to do that. So in this, <clears throat> this, in this deck, we'll talk about, you know, the data parallelations current ecosystem in the uh, data parallelations of Python. Um, this is actually, we used to call it DPPy, it's a new name called data essentials for Python. And it is a suite of packages uh, implementing a common programming model for XPU offloading um, um, to a device using Python, right? The packages in data parallelations for Python provide the necessary building blocks for developing Python packages that use SQL. Um, and also DPCTL, as I mentioned, these are uh, bindings. DPCTL is the bindings for uh, SQL classes and USM allocators 
you, you see the, an implementation of DPCTL tensor, which is actually based on Python array API standards. Um, and uh, and num, uh, DPNP is a drop-in replacement um, for NumPy, right? It's a NumPy drop-in replacement um, with the uh, optimized version of uh, handling the parallel uh, parallel internally. And um, DPEX, number DPEX is an extension for number to offload to SQL devices, number DPEX. And we'll see uh, this number DPEX extension uh, when actually we are using the kernel decorator approach and we are actually offloading uh, our work to a device using the kernel decorator approach. So we'll uh, talk about this compute follows data, right? Um, and this is the new approach that um, we are uh, starting with. Uh, the Python way of doing things, where you know, um, if you got paid, it's basically it actually based on the Python array API standard, uh, uh, and this compute following data programming model is a Python way to actually specify right on what device a computation of the kernel executes. So, the programming model is based on the notion of the you know thinking that the computation actually takes place on the device where we are actually allocating the memory. So all the data movement across um, uh, devices or between the host and device is to be explicitly specified by the user, right? And the usage inside a kernel um, uh, of two arrays actually allocated on two different devices is actually not allowed. If you see in this example, right? So first box show that, you know, it's actually executed on the default. It's a DPNP, um, it's a NumPy array, right and it's actually executing on the default device we are not passing any parameter and we are computing the same thing on the device side the second thing is right we are passing the same array with the, and we are actually passing in uh, the device as gpu and it's executed on the gpu device and the third example we'll see uh, the dp array uh, we got x on gpu 0 and y on gpu 1 but you can compute that because these two different devices are on two different devices Right, so these are on different devices and it generates an error. So this compute follows data, actually it means that computation of the device is actually happening on where the data is placed. Assume, right, we placed the input data for an algorithm, we want to run it on GPU memory, right? And the algorithm will be ran on a GPU and resulting data will be placed in the GPU along with the input data, right? And um, uh, the data does, uh, knows actually, actually the data knows which device it is located on and uh, actually which execution queue that is associated with the device. So, you know, and then the algorithm is thus run on the uh, same device. And if you see in this, uh, the same thing, right? Uh, um, the same example, but it, it's a complete, we are importing the data parallel numpy as NP and we are creating, allocating uh, X on the default device, right? And the second one, um, we, got, we are doing it on the GPU, executing on the GPU, and we are computing the results on the GPU. And the third, um, if you're actually uh, got two data items, but they're in two different devices, but they, the results uh, failure. And the last thing is, right, uh, once we are, um, done with the results, you can actually copy back the results uh, either to the device or to host, right? If you want the same data to be on the device, you can leave it on the device or you can actually copy back uh, um, to the host from the device. And But this needs to be handled explicitly in the program. And if you see this DPNP, it actually prov uh, provides array constructors like uh, dpmp.array. In this example, we are seeing dpmp.array and we can pass in parameters as device. Um, uh, which are USM type and uh, also a parameter called SQL queue. And they can create a queue passing in the device. So these two are the parameters uh, that are um, accepted by the DPNP, uh, this DP, uh, uh, DPNP array when you are using the uh, DP control uh, using this compute to follow, compute follow state approach. And uh, these actually, the parameters that I talked about, the USM type, the queue type, right? Um, these parameters allow us to specify where actually we are placing the data. And um, as mentioned, right, one more very important thing is compute follows data prevents 
computation on data located on different devices and uh, prevents implicit cross device data copying. That's, you know, just to make sure two different the data on two different can't interact with each other. So that is compute follows data and we'll see some examples uh, once we actually go to the uh, dev cloud. Uh, and let's introduce, let's actually start with what is NumPy if you're not aware. NumPy is a open source, um, NumPy aware uh, optimizing compiler for Python. It actually works best uh, for code that uses uh, things like NumPy arrays, uh, and you know, if you got lots of loops, right? Uh, this is a good candidate. It actually uses the uh, uh, LLVM compiler to generate machine code from Python bytecode. And um, uh, Numba can actually compile a large subset of. Uh, it actually, you know, it, it a large subset, you know, a large subset of numerically focused uh, Python code. As, as I mentioned, right, it has support for automatic parallelization uh, of loops, generation of CPU, GPU accelerated code. And uh, if you got U funks in your code, this is a very good candidate. So if you're, you know, it's a thumb rule, like if you got lots of numerically oriented code, uh, which does lots of mathematical computations and it uses NumPy arrays, loops and functions, then Numba is a very good choice. And uh, there are two types of operations that Numba can um, automatically uh, send it for parallel execution. One is uh, implicitly handling this data parallel regions, um, such as NumPy array expressions, NumPy U funks, or if you got any NumPy reduction functions. And this other way is explicit data parallel loops uh, that are using Numba.p range. And we'll see that in the upcoming slides. Um, and uh, the last one is the Numba DPEX, which we talked about. It's uh, uh, similar to the other GPU bank, uh, backends. Numba uh, DPEX has got the ability to op automatically offload specific data parallel sections um, using the kernel programming approach. And um, it actually incorporates the OpenCL programming style of programming. And we'll also see some examples on that. So the first thing we talk about is in the um, is interacting is the device. So the, the device represents the, the actual accelerator in the system, and um, what you're doing is you are actually you know um, creating a device selector. If you want to uh, select to a GPU, you create a GPU selector, or if you want to offload to a CPU, you create a CPU. Or so there are different types of selector. If you see in this screen, I got select G CPU device select host device, select default device, right? Select GPU device. And then I select the GPU G device and I can print the information. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more information you can print from the device. You can get the, the device name, the device vendor name, you know, uh, the driver version, uh, the maximum number of uh, work items in a device uh, that are supported in the device, right? Um, so there are lots of information you can query by, um, you know, just um, calling the print device function. Right. And the second, um, the next thing we talk about is, uh, you know, the number DPEX, uh, which we are talking about, right? Um, so it's, a, if you see the first time, first type, right? Uh, the array style programming. And um, so if you see this, a simple NumPy array, and that's you're doing an NGIT of, you know, of this. And this is actually automatically, you know, this is automatic um, offloading to a uh, device. In, uh, it's array style programming that's automatic, just using the NumPy arrays and using the NGIT. The second is we got explicit P range uh, loops. And um, uh, I'm still using the number JIT decorator, right? And in this, I'm doing an explicit for loop here, but I got a um, P range. I'm calling P range, which actually um, offloads this to a parallel. Instead of range, we're calling P range. And also we are, you're doing the explicit uh, uh, offload in parallel. The last one is the kernel style programming. And, um, um, you know, this is actually similar to, as I mentioned, Numbas, other GPU backends. Um, 
uh, like numba.cuda and numba.rock if you are familiar with that so this number uh, deepx this dppy decorator is provided in the numba deepx package similar to sql programming and um, so how, what we are doing is just we are actually you know using the low level sql kernel um, apis that can directly read in parallel so if you see you can you know if you can um, you know about all these different advanced SQL features like indexing, uh, synchronization, how you, you know, using memory fences, um, barriers, right? Um, atomics, there's other way called atomics in SQL that you can leverage. Um, something similar to atomics is something similar to vectorization and in the threading world, uh, right? And um, these are all provided by the number DPPI the kernel decorator. And actually this, uh, third approach, open style kernel programming approach. It's more handy for programmers who already have SQL and uh, GPU programming experience. And we'll see, look into these different types of uh, examples, right? So this is the automatic offload using engine decorator. And I already talked about the automatic offload. This extends the, you know, uh, it will automatically detect the data parallel kernels using the NumPy expressions. If you see, I got NumPy as a NumNP, and um, uh, and it you know it actually directly detects data parallel kernels and it you know it sends it for parallel execution. So what we do is we just use regular NumPy kernels and the compiler detects it and offloads it uh, using uh, you know to the device um, and. Um, if you see there, I got multiple NumPy data expressions here. And finally, uh, in my main, uh, what I'll do is um, I'll just um, send the device context, create a device context and offload to a device, right? So that's always the automatic offload using engine decorator works. The second is explicit parallel for loop. And the same thing approach we are following here, but the difference is we, we are importing P range from number and using the engine decorator, we directly detect the data parallel kernels using the NumPy expressions, right? And if you see in this example, we got um, P range to specify explicitly a loop to be parallelized for, to uh, send for parallel execution. And finally, we're still using uh, the, the DPCTL device, uh, DP, the DPCTL module to offload to a uh, device. Right. So these are the two different types. One is automatic offload approach using NumPy's and the other is explicit parallel um, using uh, P-range. But we are offloading to a device um, uh, once we you know, create these engine decorators. The third one is the kernel decorator. I, and we talked about this, right? And this one actually is the SQL or the OpenCL way of programming style. And um, so I got this uh, dppy.kernel decorator declared here. And, um, um, and if you know in the GPU world space, this is a very common way of kernel execution invocation where you pass in, uh, you know, the, uh, the parallel, the actual, this is something similar to a Lambda function in C++. And we pass in the, um, the global size of the work items and the local size of the work group as a, you know, in, uh, as an index in this. And um, we're passing in ABC. We're just doing a simple vector addition here, A, B, and C, right? And I define the global size, which is, the, let's say, the total number of items uh, in my iteration space, right? And I got two arrays defined here. And um, uh, we are offloading. To the device using the device context, right? Offering with GPU. And if you see, I'm passing in this is the kernel. The driver function is a kernel which comes here. here. And this becomes in turn to the DPPEC kernel decorator. And it, this data parallel, uh, this vector addition is uh, performed in parallel on the device side. Right. So these are the three different approaches uh, using the number DPEX package. So with these implementations, we can actually look at simple examples uh, in the real world, right? Um, um, and uh, the other coming upcoming web series, uh, upcoming, sorry, upcoming uh, learning series that we'll be um, talking 
on this is a complete walkthrough of some of the important algorithms like pairwise uh, or k-means algorithm, uh, right? So we'll be doing uh, explicitly, you know, showing much complete in detail talking on this using multiple approaches, using NGIT and uh, kernel decorators, and we'll see the compute follow JIT approach, everything, right? Uh, in the upcoming, the second and third series of uh, this learning path. But just in a nutshell, in the slides, you can see, you know, pairwise distance is a, you know, it's a simple algorithm that takes a set of multidimensional points and it computes the Euclidean distance, right, between uh, every pair of points. And, and uh, in this example, we are using the kernel decorator. And, uh, you know, if you see, um, we got the global ID, which is the actual linear ID of the element. Uh, we collect, get the global ID, uh, which is still, again, the OpenCL or the kernel SQL way of uh, programming. And um, um, so, you know, we are actually getting the index of the tele elements and then we are actually calculating the pairwise distance. I'm sorry, right? Um, we are actually doing, you know, if you see, um, x2 minus x1 whole pair plus uh, y2 minus y1. So we'll compute the pairwise Euclidean distance calculation and we do a square root of that. So the, all this computation is done in this. And um, you see this happens in parallel. But we are explicitly using the DPPy kernel approach <clears throat> and uh, uh, we are actually offloading to a device and uh, uh, we just, you know, uh, calling the uh, pairwise Python function from here, offloading to the device, and making sure that this is offloaded device um, and executes on parallel. Uh, this is an example. Um, so this slide, sorry, this slide looks clustered, but just to give you an overview of how to use the ng, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, this will be um, taught in depth in the upcoming series, but if you just see, you know, where you came in, it's also, um, you know, this, uh, if you see it's a clustering algorithm and based upon uh, the centroids, the, the points in the space get clustered and the centroids get adjusted, right? So this is the k-means. Um, uh, we are using the k-means algorithm to compute the cluster of points and, uh, you know, cluster as per the centroids, right? And uh, I'm using the, number JIT decorator here. We saw the kernel approach before. And um, the first step is we are assigning the points to cluster and update the centroids array after computation. And um, uh, finally, right, once we perform the k-means uh, algorithm and we are offloading to a device and we are actually passing in these functions um, that actually clusters and then, you know, the same iteration that happens to get the centroids get updated and to until they say there's no more adjustment to be made, right? So all this algorithm is actually passed with the device context and sent to a device. And if you can see, um, we are using the um, explicit way of handling where we got the for loops here and we are calling number.pdange and all these are handling uh, used by the explicit way of offloading to a device and using the pdange. And here we'll see the implicit handling using the numpies. Uh, an ex another example is black rolls algorithm, which is you know quite uh, popular in um, the financial world where you got the options, right? There's a strike price and the strike date and the options price, the calls and puts changes every second. And you know, black rolls is uh, such a huge computation that happen uh, every second, millions of operations, right? And um, um, we don't need to go in depth into the details of the implementation of black holes here, but uh, if you see in this, uh, it's using the engine decorator and um, uh, we're calling the calls and puts with the change in the current price and the strike price. And if you see all these are, um, you know, we're not, this is also using the P range uh, and we are calling for a loop and this is also using P range, right? And then, uh, we'll offload this uh, to a uh, GPU uh, using uh, the DPCTL layer again. We'll actually look at one of the examples using the automatic offload um, 
in the when we are doing the hands-on session, right? So this is the uh, uh, overview of you know the whatever we are talk going to uh, uh, perform the hands-on on the Intel Dev Cloud or GLC. So just to um, give a glimpse of uh, what is Intel Dev Cloud. So I already pasted the, the chat window, the link to Dev Cloud. So it's a simple two step to like, you know, two minute process for you to get registered to. I can actually walk you through um, uh, the interface of Dev Cloud and you know how you can actually um, download the um, source code required for this. Uh, uh, hands-on exercises that we are going to do today. But DevCloud is a development sandbox. I talked about Intel One API and Text Toolkit, and that's a lot of software to install, right? It's almost like, you know, uh, it's almost like in you know, gigabytes, and uh, then you need to have different devices like GPUs or FPGAs or whatever, right? But DevCloud is a development sandbox. You got everything in built, just create an account and get going. And um, they got, you got you know access to uh, Intel GPUs and uh, uh, you know uh, FPGAs. You can actually you know just create an account, uh, get started, and you know start your programming, right? Um, so you got I think if you create an account, you have one twenty days of free access. So and I you know if you got a good project, you know you can just request an extension, and you know you can get the extension too after 180, 120 days. But you know uh, the main thing is you know no downloads, no hardware acquisition, and there is no installation. Just set up, uh, you know, just install, just create the account and get going in seconds. Uh, and um, uh, we'll see actually the interface so and uh, see how we can actually. Uh, uh, get hands on to the dev cloud, right? And um, let me sh stop sharing my screen and let me actually walk you through the dev cloud interface. If you're able to see my screen, uh, dev cloud, And um, I hope you are able to see my screen here. Um, so once you create an account, right? So as I go to the link I gave you in the chat window, once you are able to um, create an account, so the starting point is uh, get start um, here, right? Click on get, get started tab and you scroll down. So there are two ways you can actually connect Dev Cloud. You can actually use SSH and connect through the SSH, and you know, like use as a regular Linux, regular Linux server interface, or you can actually interact using the Jupyter Lab, uh, and you know, uh, and you can interact with the code samples using the Jupyter. If you're aware with, aware of the Jupyter Lab environment, so I click on <clears throat> launch Jupyter Lab. Right, and uh, once I click on the launch Jupyter Lab, so you come to the home page, um, and uh, you see the click on the top window, the new launcher, and there's a terminal option here. <clears throat> you can actually go to the terminal. Thing it's a little bit slow, but let's give it some time so we can actually create the terminal. And... Let me run this again.
I'm just trying to see. If I can hide this. Um, I want to have a better visibility here. Let me just. Yeah, that's what I'm trying for. So uh, I'm mean, already got it. So let's see if I got a terminal here, <clears throat> right? And um, so I created a folder and just git clone the source from this um, GitHub. Uh, let me paste it here. So once you get, once you clone the directory, uh, get um, get directory, right, and all the source code will be downloaded onto your dev cloud account, right. Actually, um, once you are able to download, I'll go to my new demo folder, right, and navigate to number DP passions health scores here. I will get to number TP and you know, click on the welcome.ipymb. So there are all the um, multiple modules here. Today we are actually talking about introduction to data parallel Python and introduction to data parallel control, right? And these two are um, clearly detailed. Module zero is nothing but it's the way of, uh, you know, people who are not familiar with Jupyter Lab, right? It's just a simple exercise for, um, because these Jupyter Labs are self-learning, self-paced. So it's just for people who are not acquainted with Jupyter Lab. So if you're interested, you can look into that. It's a simple exercise. It says that Jupyter Labs, you know, Jupyter Notebooks are sequential and you, um, until unless you make a change in the previous cell, the, the rest of the cells will not be able to understand. So it's all sequential and, you know, it's all the basics of Jupyter that's um, explained in this. Right, and then welcome. Dot IPVN. Not can close this, and uh, yeah. So we got this right, and then click on introduction to DPPy, and this is the first module we talked about um, the one API programming challenges. And uh, so the main thing, main takeaway here, right, is um, DevCloud is also a login compute node way of working. So once you, this actually is a login node. If I logged in here, this is a login node. And actually you need to submit your jobs to a compute node using QSub command, right? And um, the way we handle this is because this is self-learning and to make it easier, uh, we created a, um, a wrapper for QSub, a Q script called a Q script. And it simply uses a QSub command QSub dash L and it's submitting a GPU. And actually we are passing in the actual script that needs to be run on the compute node, right? And um, so, you know, it's just to make it easier, but that's how DevCloud, you know, you got a script and you need to send a QSub command to the compute node, specific to if you want a GPU, submits a job, it waits for some time, like 10, 20 seconds based upon the DevCloud availability, uh, right? And then it results, returns the results back. Um, as an output file. Um, so that's all the interfaces I want to, be, before going to the hands-on, right? I just want to make uh, you acquainted with the uh, dev cloud environment, right? And there's one more uh, thing that needs to be noted here is um, all the uh, node, uh, notebooks that in all the notebooks, right? we got the source code of all the samples with the technical details and information necessary so that these are self-learning and you know you can learn it on your own pace and um, if i want to make a simple change to the code let's say you know this is the engine automatic engine code that we talked about right and um, so if you see uh, we got number.engit and we got uh, numpy um, uh, and these are 
this will use the automatic offload approach, right? So I just need to run this triangle cell and and run this build and run section like this, right? And then if you see, it submits the job and it waits for the output for the compute node to get the results back. Let's give it some time, uh, hopefully, you know, but I, in the interest of time, I actually ran all the samples before. And if you see the output, uh, it ran on that some other example, it ran on a device and uh, uh, we got the results back, right? Yeah, so I just ran this and if you see it ran on the Intel graphics device and um, it took around two seconds for this um, number jit offload approach to work. Before actually I'm even running into the code samples, I also want to show you the JLSC setup so that you know um, we can actually uh, uh, get hands-on on the JLSC too, right? So this is the JLSC notebook setup that I already made. Um, um, so this is a Jupyter environment. This is running on JLSC and um, I can actually run this, right? So on the JLSC, it's also the same way, um, but what is right, I actually logged in, I, I got an interactive node, QIris node on the JLSC, and then I reverse tunnel into that Iris node and created a Jupyter network. So it's actually in the compute node I'm running here. The same example I ran here, right? It just runs, um, it doesn't take much time because I'm actually on the compute node and just, you know, submit the job and we get the results back. And actually, the, the, I will paste in the steps that are necessary for the JLSC setup. These are actually will be provided with the slides. And let me paste in the steps, right? And um, we got around 40 minutes. So yeah, we can actually um, try to do this exercise here for 10, it takes 10 minutes. So, All right, so let me paste this in the chat window. All right, I paste in the steps, but let me actually uh, close my session and create a fresh session so that you know you can actually also see what's going on here. All right, let me share my screen again and uh, All right, so I'm going to, uh, if you got JLSC account, right? Uh, you can only do that if you got JLSC account and access to the Iris nodes on this. So let me start with this with my WSL session. Let me actually also exit out of this. Exit. All right. So let me first log into my JLSE account and uh, All right, so I'm logged in to my JLSC account. And the first step we need to do is... Um, uh, Praveen, I just wanted to mention that not, not all of them will have access to that system. 
Ah, okay. So then uh, we don't need to do this then. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so how we handle this now is we need to do the hands-on session, right? So actually, um, yeah, I provide the steps necessary so you can actually walk in in your, if you got an account, you can walk in your free time, but let me actually go to the dev cloud again and run the samples, right? So that, you know, we're not um, um, stopping in this. So, but if I, I already showed you the interface of the JLSE and right, uh, so you can actually, um, run the same on the JLSE environment. So the first step, first one is the data pal, number data pal essentials, Python. This module, right? So let's talk about um, the basics, right? Um, why are we even doing the motivation behind this parallel Python, right? And um, most of the, uh, you know, general example, right? Uh, the first thing we just learn is serial and uh, most common language, we, you know, is a for loop that you want to apply parallelism, right? And um, looking at this for, in this code, uh, the following for loop, it takes like, you know, millions of operations. We are sending it over here. And um, it actually, you know, uh, it's just a simple vector addition. And it actually handles everything sequentially done and doesn't apply any parallelism. Because of the way this code is written, this is a very good candidate to actually start with the Numba framework. Numba uses a decorator, as I mentioned, right? Um, which will actually apply to parallelism to this code. And let's run this without the parallel execution, right? And actually ran this already. And it took me around 24 seconds uh, to run this same code. So, and the second way, you know, we are actually now adding the number JIT here. And uh, um, so previously we were doing everything sequentially. And once we apply this uh, decorator, and um, the Dumba JIT decorator actually applies this code in parallelism. And because this works, because the original Python code is you know, written in primitives and data types that can be easily compiled and factorized for a GPU. And applying this actually, you know, and if you run the code again here, I ran the same code, it took around five seconds. So, you know, we got just applying a simple decorator with NJIT, we applied, you know, it's just because the depth cloud has got some lag between compute and login nodes, but the same thing if we observe in JLSE, right, it's almost below a second that uh, actually if you are on the compute node. So that's the main motivation behind uh, all this parallelism, right, for a Python code. And uh, we talked about the data parallel control, and uh, we talked about the uh, automatic offload approach using NGIT and um, and the explicit pa parallel for loop, right? So let's look at the explicit parallel for loop. I got this NGIT here, uh, defined here, and we got, we're adding two arrays. Uh, this is simple vector addition, a, B and C. A. And, uh, you know, we are copying B and C to A, right? It's, and if you see, I'm using a P range function here, explicitly uh, using the NGIT decorator and the P range here. And um, I got um, uh, np.1s, I mean, these are simple ones, uh, 10 elements, right? And um, I'm just um, creating a device context, dpctl, and we're passing in this function at two arrays, right? And so this is using the explicit uh, uh, parallel for loop. And once I run the code, we got the results to computed on the device side, right? Which is Intel HD graphics. And this one using using the automatic offload using uh, NGIT. And we talked about this. This is a simple, again, the pairwise. It's not pairwise, but it's L2 distance. Something similar that we talked about, but it's all using an, uh, the NumPy square roots. I got NumPy's, uh, right? Um, uh, NumPy elements A, B, and C. And uh, we are doing lots of NumPy operations. We are subtracting. We are then you know squaring that. And then we are summing it. and it's X to the same thing with the logic we for Euclidean distance calculation, right? Everything is handled by the NumPy's and it's a uh, automatic offload. Just create a NG decorator with parallel true and and then you know call in this function 
right here. We random we created X and Y with random variables, and then I'm creating the device context, um, creating the device and passing in the device context and passing in the function, thus uploading to the device, and um, ran the code again on the, the GPU, right? And we got this uh, output. And there is a calculator, it's, it's running on the device and the result is, um, you know, we got the time taken to run the parallel computation on the device side. And the third approach we talked about is the explicit parallel offloading using the uh, kernel decorator, right? This is also a simple uh, um, vector addition, but it's a two dimensional array uh, here. It's a sort of like a matrix addition. And I got the dpy.kernel decorator declared here. And uh, if you see, um, getting the global ID of i and j, right? So it's uh, it provides actual, it will be automatic, uh, create a linear ID in the iteration space and it creates the actual particular item that needs to go through the loop. And we are actually offloading, um, you know, this is actual kernel, which is matrix addition, right? Which happens in parallel. And the driver function, which we thought it's the GPU programming style, right? Um, where we are passing in the total number of iteration, total number of the range, which is iteration space. We're also passing in the local size, default local size of the group items and um, the uh, data items that needs to be passed to the function, right? And we got uh, array dimensions as eight and eight. So, and the global size defined um, as eight, right? And we are actually initializing um, A and B with random values. And finally, we are actually creating a device and offloading to the device using the DPCTL layer. And we're actually passing in the actual kernel, the driver function that actually invokes the kernel and offloads the work to a device. And this matrix addition, we ran it on the device. And uh, I'm not running this on the dev cloud just because for each run, it takes uh, around you know, 30, 40 seconds. So you know, I can run the last sample and see how much time it takes. But so this is also running on the um, device uh, level zero GPU and I got A and B here randomized to these values and I got the C, which is a matrix addition, which is computed on the device side, right? We'll run this example, simple. It's again a simple TPP kernel, you know, there's a couple of steps, simple, and we'll run it on the actual submit to the device and see in live, right? Uh, same thing, this is matrix multiplication now, it's not matrix addition, uh, it's a gem operation and, um, it's implemented as a kernel function, the same logic that we talked about before, right? Um, getting the linear IDs of these elements when, um, uh, as per the SQL programming style. And uh, um, I'm actually doing the matrix computation here, matrix multiplication, right? This is a pretty well-known <clears throat> logic in the matrix multiplication space, the same thing, uh, I got uh, XS1024, YS16, and we defined the global size, right? And um, now uh, we got A, B, and C initialized. And I got the driver function uh, with the dimensions of the grid and the block dimensions, right? Which is local size and the global size that uh, we talked about. And then I'm selecting the default device and I'm actually passing in the driver function to this, right? And um, uh, we are uploading to the device and this is nothing but host compute. This is for standard using standard NumPy, just checking the results. Just a sanity check, we passed it to the device and then here this just using a serial host computation by using NumPy's and just making sure, you know, they are the same. Let me run this, uh, you know, if I want to make any code change, let's say I want to comment, sorry, comment this out or if I make any change, right? Um, 
and then I went to run this code to make sure the changes are, because I told these are all sequential, right? These changes will only be reflected once I run the cell, right? I run the cell and, and if you see the results, you know, we got on the device side, but let me run this and make sure, you know, you're also aware of how this actually is happening on live on the dev cloud, right? Sometimes based upon the time, like, you know, let's, let's say there are more than 100 uh, users on the dev cloud at a time. Sometimes it can, uh, the queues can be delayed and uh, you may get the results a little bit more, take, may take more time. But yeah, if you see now it took, took around, you know, 30 seconds, but I got my results computed and, um, uh, you know, the output is sent back from the compute node to the uh, login node. Right. So this is the basics of the uh, number DPP layer that we talked about. Let's actually go to welcome.ipynb again, and now go to the DPCTL module, which is, uh, which already told, this is the uh, Python wrapper for a subset of all the SQL API classes, right? And um, you get hands-on to the platform, device, uh, device selectors, and I will also see the unified shared memory approach. Um, we'll see the compute follows data, all in this module. And um, if you see, um, I can manage SQL devices using DPCTL, using multiple functions for device context or queue. Um, get a device, you can create a platform, right? The most important things you generally may do is create a DPCTL device or a queue. These are the two most common things that you do, uh, but there are a lot more things that you can, you know. Um, so for example, you're using import DPCTL and you're selecting a SQL device and you want to get hold of a level zero GPU, right? You select the level zero DPU, GPU here and you can print the device information. Or you can actually call in the device selectors, as I mentioned, select CPU device, select um, GPU device, and you can actually print the device information. Let's actually run the code here, right? This is a sample code. And in this code, the main device function, I'm passing in the device D that I got and printing the device information, right? And uh, the first one is create default device. So de default device is nothing but, you know, uh, the system actually selects the best available. You don't pass any parameter to your queue, to your device, right? When you're calling, um, then if you're not passing any parameter, it's a default selector and the system actually selects the best available device, right? So uh, I can create in two ways, using dpctl.sql device or dpctl.select default device, right? And this should be the same. And I'm actually printing the device information. The second way, right, if you want a GPU device, then uh, you can use dpctl.sql device of GPU, or you can actually get the dpctl of select GPU device, or you can actually specifically say level zero GPU or open CL GPU, you can pass in the parameter, right? And you should, uh, you know, just make sure these two are the same, right? Whatever the GPU available is, uh, you'll get, uh, there's one way you can do is a fallback mechanism, right? If create GPU device only if it's present. So you can create simple CPU, so DPCTL or SQL device, create a GPU device. And if there's a fallback, you don't create, get a GPU device instead of failing, right? You create a fallback of a CPU. Uh, if there is no GPU, then offload a CPU and print the information on that. The other thing is custom device selector, right? So you, um, uh, it happens that, let's say you got multiple devices on your system, CPU, GPUs, you got two or three different type of GPUs and, and you got a FPGA, so you got multiple devices, let's say, right? And you want to give ranking. So which one is the best one you want to prefer to if it's available? So based upon this custom device selection logic, you know, you get all the devices that are available 
and um, uh, you choose a device and you provide the score with the highest, um, you get the highest default device score, right? And uh, all the other way is you set up a score. Actually, you can, there's a way you can, uh, you, in C++ uh, side of things, right? Um, you create a default, uh, sorry, create a uh, custom device selector inheriting from the device selector and you give the logic that uh, if I find a vendor specific GPU like this, give the highest rating. Or you can actually leave it to the default selector to give the score and make you know uh, your device selection based upon this logic, right? So that is custom device selection. And uh, I just run this code and right, and we run this code. Oh, actually I ran this code already, but yeah, let's run it again. Just Well, that's baking. Praveen, I've just got a quick question and I've, I've basically answered it, but you may countermand my, my statement. The question is, does DPPY work on any platform? My response to this point is that it's part of Intel's reference implementation of one API. So for now, as far as I know, uh, this is for Intel platforms for now. Is that a fair statement? Yes, yeah, it comes with the Intel distribution of Python and that's correct, yeah. I mean, if the question is, uh, let me look at the question. Yeah, it's specific to DPPY. And so uh, while it is part of our reference implementation of the AI toolkit, AI analytics yeah. toolkit. Yeah, this is part yeah. of the AI analytics toolkit. Um, it actually, you know, comes with one API based toolkit and AI analytics toolkit as part of the Intel distribution of Python. And uh, that's correct. So it's part of the Intel. So yeah, we got the results uh, back, and we you know we're printing the device information of all the things uh, we were actually you know uh, querying for, right? The other thing is queue, right? I told two different ways. One is TPCTL. If you want to uh, queue, is nothing but it's uh, um, it uh, it manages the work that is offloaded to the device, and you pass in the device that you created to the queue. So, and then you submit the work, right? And if you can see this example, I'm importing DPCTL and I'm creating a queue, which is default here, right? So the system selects the best available device. Or I create a queue, which is a GPU, and I got some properties defined here. And I can talk about some of the properties uh, like uh, in order queue and stuff. And, um, in this example, we are creating a simple GPU queue and uh, uh, we are passing in the SQL, you know, the device that we generated over here, right? So let's look at the actual example. And I'll also talk about some of the properties like in order queue and stuff, which are actually famous on the SQL programming side. Um, so the, here we're creating a default queue and then passing not, not any parameters here, right? So this is very basic. And this is actually based upon filter selection. And we got this um, fallback mechanism, CPU or CPU. And I'm actually passing an extra property called in order queue or enable profiling. So, and in order queue is, you know, if you're aware of these um, graphs in a uh, heterogeneous programming or a SQL, right? I got multi, let's say I got multiple kernels and these kernels are dependent upon the data, right? The, it, it depends on the data is dependent upon these kernels, let's say, you know, single data is uh, data A, let's say it's uh, kernel one, two, and three are also handling the same data here, right? So kernel two needs to wait, let's say, for finishing of kernel one and kernel three needs to wait in turn for the finishing of kernel two, there is a data dependency, 
right? The way it is handled automatically is you create a order queue and uh, the runtime actually handles this uh, automatically, all this synchronization of the data. It waits till the previous job is, all the enqueued kernels are complete before the next execution happens. So that's how you create another queue and then, you know, um, you can create multiple kernels with the same data, um, avoiding any type of race conditions. And also profiling, if you want any profiling, like, you know, any debug information from your run, anything, right? You create enable profiling and you can actually generate lots of uh, GPU specific debug information. And um, the other example is we have seen that, you know, creating queue from a device, right? And I mean, as I said, before we have seen a GPU device, now we are seeing OpenCL CPU device. And um, we are creating the queue from that. And there's one more thing called sub device. You can create a queue from a sub device. You can actually partition it, let's say a CPU to four. And let's say you want to you just uh, send your work to partition zero which is the first one, right? Uh, then you can actually um, partition using subdivisors and you can actually create a queue offloading to the first part of the device. So that's how you can actually split your device and offload your work to multiple, offload multiple kernels to multiple partitions, right? That's one way of creating a subdivise. Um, and this is the same partition, but with uh, multiple with context created, you know, and which we don't need to really worry about, but it's just that you're creating each context for separate context for separate devices. And then you pass in all the functions uh, and run the code, I ran the code. It just prints the device information, right? It's like Intel HD graphics and um, I partition. If you see the partition code is run as three, Right, and um, that's a queue creation. There's an example that shows how to create. So let's quickly talk about unified shared memory. And it's a it's a famous thing in SQL specifications. It's a pointer-based approach for um, uh, data management between host and device. And if you see in the real world, CPU and GPU got different memories, uh, host memory and GPU memory, but the unified shared memory standpoint, they come under the same memory, CPU and GPU, and they're looking at the same memory. So you explicitly create a malloc, if you're a C++ programmer, right? It's a malloc, create a malloc shared or malloc device based upon, I'll, I'll talk you, um, walk you through. And then, you know, this device can be, this memory can be accessed across Western device. That's a unified shared memory, right? And if you see in this, uh, this memory, if you're creating a USM memory device, this uh, this is a only accessible on the device. If you're creating a host, uh, sorry, uh, if you're creating a shared memory, then that can be accessed between host and the device. So just create a host um, uh, array and you know uh, host memory and and then send it to the device and you know uh, explicit this actually implicitly being uh, handled. So this being uh, perform the work on the device and this is the same memory is available on the host side too. So that, that's all the two different types of memories available uh, using the USM. So let's run some examples on that. And especially the from the uh, Python world, right? So this DPCTL memory, it provides uh, the Python objects for actually this untyped uh, USM memory uh, uh, Pointers. So this this creates a uh, Python objects for that. As I mentioned, right, shade pointers and device pointers. So um, Python um, these Python objects are created. Uh, this DPCTL memory provides these uh, Python objects to handle these shade pointers and uh, uh, the uh, the host pointers or the device pointers. And these uh, Python objects to shared and host pointers implement this uh, simple Python buffer protocol. And uh, using this simple buffer protocol, it is therefore uh, possible for you for us to use these objects to manipulate this USM memory using our numpies or byte arrays or any type of array classes, right? And um, let's look at these examples here, simple examples. Um, yeah, in this example, right, um, I created a memory, USM shared memory here, MS, and MD is memory USM device. 
right? This is actually accessible on the host, on the device. This is only accessible on the device. And they created a host buffer, and I just created a buffer, host buffer, and randomized the values, right? This is just the host uh, buffer, I, host pointer I created. Not sorry, not the pointer, but host buffer I created. And now, explicitly using copy from host function, I'm actually, you know, copying the um, uh, host buffer to the device memory. So this is USM device buffer, right? So this is only available on our device now, right? And the other way of handling thing is um, from the device memory, copy from device, and now we are passing it to the host, uh, the shared pointer that we created. So this is accessible across both host and the device. This is only accessible on the device. And then what we are doing is simply build an NumPy array. It's just an example, you know, <clears throat> to show the what's the difference between host and state device. And pass an array and, uh, you know, I'm passing in the, as I mentioned, right? This can be understand um, by the uh, uh, python.memory class, you know, by the buffer protocol, we're passing in the buffer, which is the, uh, use some shared object here. And I'm just, you know, uh, creating a simple buffer array, uh, X, which is an umpire array, right? And um, we are actually, you know, copying that to the ND array here. And we are simply viewing these three objects, how they look like, and they should be the same, right? Just uh, the main thing is we created a host buffer and we just, you know, exchange this to a device buffer and then coming back to the host buffer and making it a shared buffer and then copying the shade to the ND array on the host. And then we are printing all the things and uh, let's run this and make sure they're all okay, equal. While it's running, uh, yeah. We see something in the chat window. Yeah, there were just questions for being just about um, the comparison of DPPY to Dask. So I took a stab at it here, but um, basically I was just saying it was both DPPY as well as the broader uh, toolkit was my understanding of the question. So the the to just paraphrase it, it's you know one API AI analytics toolkit spans much 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 more than just the DPPY things that we're showing you here with Numba. It's oh yeah yeah, yeah. a bunch. So including Modin, which can take advantage of Dask and Ray under the hood, depending. So, I mean, it depends on which direction that you go with this. I think specifically with respect to DPPY and Praveen, you can correct me where I'm wrong, but, but um, you're looking at basically the parallelization. We're parallelizing these loops and that's, that relates to the number of cores and the number of threads that you have. But additionally, the toolkit, the one API toolkit is um, innately aware of the SIMD lanes that are under the hood. And so even with just a single core, single thread, you can get high performance speedups just from taking advantage of the wider vector lanes. Then if you do on top of that parallelism, in other words, you're not limiting yourself to one core, you're, you're allowing yourself to take advantage of all the cores in your system, then those, those concepts are orthogonal or complementary. So they're not limiting necessarily each other. So that was my answer and Fien, you can uh, correct. Yeah, thanks, yeah. 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 As also Bob mentioned, right? This is, uh, and I showed you in the slides, um, this data parallel essentials is just a simple, single part of it, but there are a lot more like intellectual surface circuit on the PyTorch, um, and there are a lot more other um, important modules that are uh, a big part of the ABA analytics toolkit. 
All right, so let's talk about the, you know, we, uh, we ran the example and we see the view, they're exactly the same. This is the host buffer, we device buffer, and once we copy to host, we saw the same thing. So we just manipulated um, the uh, data between host and device. And let's run the compute follow state output that we talked about, right? So there are two ways. So the main takeover from compute follows data, if you remember the slide, um, the uh, computation happens wherever the data resides. Right, we pass into a device, and the computation happens on the device side. And so there are two ways we can, um, two approaches uh, in this. So if you're using numpy.ndra, right? So we are we have seen lots of uh, numpy.ndra's examples, right? We are simply calling the kernel function, and then uh, uh, we are offloading directly offloading to a device. That's how we are handling that in all the examples we have seen, right? But the compute follows data. It, it, it uses a SQL USM uh, array interfaces. Right, and let's see. And this SQL USM array interfaces um, uh, that we are going to create, <clears throat> right? We actually um, showing the way how they can be offloaded to the, the how the data can be uh, using the USM that we talked about. Uh, how this data can be reside on the device, and how the computation happens on the device side, right? And let's see an example uh, using this uh, SQL USM array interfaces. You see in this example, right? I got two functions: allocate SQL user, uh, SQL USM array interface, and um, the TPP kernel is a simple vector addition that we were doing before. And with the same logic that we were doing the initial one, right? The the first one, we are passing the device, right? Um, we got A and B, and um, C is a calculation of A and A plus B, and we are actually using the context manager specifying target to a GPU. But let's see the compute follows data approach here, right? Created a USM type as device, right? I got A, B, uh, which are random values. And now I created a device using the DPC or SQL device of GPU. And, uh, um, and then I created a queue out of this device, which is a queue that is targeted to uh, uh, targeted with a GPU device. And we are actually passing into the allocate um, this uh, uh, this function, which is uh, USM array interface function. And let's see what's happening here. And allocate uh, SUA data function. We got A, B, you passed in the USM type, which is, you know, we are defining the device type, uh, the memory USM memory as device type, which is only available on the device. And we're also passing, passing in the queue that we created. Right, so the DA, the data ASM array, we are using DPT is nothing but uh, import DPCTL tensor as DPT, and then we talked about the DPCTL tensor, which is you know uh, it provides a, a Python array, um, uh, right? Uh, and uh, so the DPT USM, we are creating a USM dot ND array. You're passing in the shape, and you're actually passing in the buffer USM type as device, right? And then the constructor to device is Q. So that's how you're creating. Now this actually you're allocating a uh, memory on the device side you're, and uh, on the device side, which is a USM device type, right? And you're actually manually copying that USM data dot copy from host to the device, right? Similarly, exactly you're doing with DB, which is uh, uh, the data item B, you're creating another, um, USM array interface, array um, and the array, right? Using the DPCTL tensor, and um, you're passing in uh, the device type and the queue. Similarly, you're copying from the host to the device, and exactly the last one, right? See also, we are creating a USM device memory, and uh, we are actually explicitly, um, you know, creating the queue. And you know this computation happens on the device because this is device memory, right? This actually happens on the device. And now we are returning A, B, and C. And what we are doing here is, right? We are calling this particular function. And once you got the data, right? Remember this is actually on the computation is happened on the device, right? And then we are actually manually copying, um, you know, so, then we are calling the sum kernel function. 
So now we got the allocate, we allocated it. We are not passing in the, any of the DPCDL um, device context manually, specifically here, right? So we are just calling the, so the computation happens exactly where the data resides. It's on the device now, right? And finally, once I got my results back on the DC is computed, is computed, then I'm actually manually copying it using copy to host uh, using the, um, the same uh, DPC PL tensor function, right? And then, you know, uh, we got the just calculating expected is A plus B and, you know, we're calling these two functions. So uh, this should be the same. Uh, just it's a vector addition, right? So the sum kernel and the expected should be the same. And once I done, uh, you should see that it says that, you know, the value is the same. So, well, it's stunning, right? Let's also simply look at a simple example using the intellections for scikit-learn. This is uh, upcoming sessions that we're going to planning to do, but this to just nutshell, this intellections for scikit-learn, it provides, you know, the data scientists with, um, you know, with the uh, better performance and uh, exactly same functional equivalent of multiple patched versions of uh, popular scikit-learn algorithms. And um, uh, so if you, these are, you know, to access these optimized algorithms, right? Uh, compared to the stock scikit-learn algorithms, you just need to do is install the one API analytics toolkit, and you just need to apply the patch from sklearn import patch sklearn and uh, call the patch sklearn function. It's an example like this. If you see the previous results, um, and you know we are comparing these two, and you know they are passed, right? Mm -hmm. And we can get crazy gains. I, I, if you guys are interested at some point with a, a workshop on this, I'm putting one together and the gains can be crazy, you know, just on using code that's already optimized for you. So it's sort of like, just use it. You don't have to create a bunch of custom stuff. When you need the custom stuff, you do what we're doing right now. When you can just take advantage of something that's already rolled, roll with the fast one, right? So that's the idea. Yeah. So uh, this topic is completely different, but you know, I'm just showing the compute follows data using this approach. Um, so, you know, simple, if you want to apply the patch, you use from sklearn import patch uh, sklearn and you actually import the function. Let's say we are doing a simple DB scan, you know, this is, you know, DB scan is similar to another clustering type of algorithms and it's sequential, you know, you know, we know all the logic of DB scan, it's, you know, it extends the uh, computation of the points as per the uh, parameters that were passed into the function to create a cluster, right? So um, the simple DB scan example, we're using the compute follows data, right? So I'm importing the patch from sklearn import patch scan, and I'm actually, you know, importing the DB scan from the patch, which is Intel optimized version of DB scan, right? And similarly, I got a device, SQL device GPU, and uh, uh, what we did with the, and previously, Q is we're passing in the same device type. Here actually, we are actually casting. We previously, if you remember, we are using DPCTL or tensor art and we are not casting anything. We're just creating a array memory type and we're actually manually copying the device. This is another way of doing things. And um, I got a, a NumPy array defined here. And now we are actually, you know, moving the data to device memory by casting that using the DPCTL or tensor. And uh, from NumPy, right, you're creating uh, this uh, device memory which is USM type is device memory and the queue is GPU, right? Now the data is residing on the device side, right? This is, we move the data to device and we just call the <clears throat> DB scan function and we call the fit.predict with this data. This, this is all happening on the device, right? And uh, that's it, right? But if you want to carry back the results, anything like let's say the output is labels host, right? It, it detects the labels generated, right? And so what I do is I use the, again, the DPC Taylor tensor, and now I'm reverse casting back to NumPy from the device to the host, right? Um, and uh, we're printing the labels host. So this is other way of, uh, uh, let me run this, using the compute follows data, um, also introducing to the Intel extensions for scikit-learn. So this will be going to be part of our future topics uh, that will be, uh, uh, you know, 
part of the learning path series and the workshops that we do. Right? So we saw the two different ways of compute follows data here, right? And uh, once we done that, we can actually close. This. We can wrap up the session.